start? Yeah. Awesome. Um, are you are you streaming, Abi? So shall I get started, or maybe? Oh, oh, you you, you do the intro first. Sorry, yeah, yes, it's streaming. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Oh, you're streaming. Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, let's welcome Jim Fan from Nvidia to our CSL seminar. Uh, you may also see his name, Lindsay, from all the papers. Jim is a research scientist at Nvidia AI. His research interest spans foundation models, embodied agents, robotics, game AI, multimodal learning, and large-scale AI systems. He obtained his PhD degree in computer science at Stanford University, advised by Fei Li. His PhD thesis was titled Training and Deploying Visual Agents at Scale. Previously, Jim did research internships at NVIDIA, Google Cloud AI, OpenAI, Baidu Silicon Valley AI Lab, and Milak Back AI Institute. He graduated summa cum laude with a bachelor degree in computer science from Columbia University. Jim with the Valedictorian well, uh, well, of Class 2016 and the recipient of um, Elite medal, uh, medal at Columbia. Yeah, thank you Sorry so much. For the Tongzhou. pronunciation. N no worries. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Tongzhou, for the kind introduction. So um, today, I am very excited to share with you a new initiative called Mind Dojo. And uh, thanks, Tongzhou has already intro introduced most of it. And I'll just quickly fly over this slide. So I got my PhD degree at Fayface Lab from Stanford last year. And currently I'm a research scientist at Animas Group. So I've heard that wise people say attention is all you need. So my full-time job now is to chant magic spells to transformers, hoping they will show me some miracles. Uh, but jokes aside, I'm very interested in large scale portraying models or the so-called foundation models for embodied agents. So a grand challenge in policy learning is to build a generally capable agent. But what does that mean? I argue that a journalist agent should have the following properties. First, it should be able to pursue open-ended objectives. And here, I mean very complex, semantically rich and open world objectives, usually specified by language. And GPT-3 is one familiar example of a model that can do open-ended tasks in NLP. You explain what you want in the prompt and then GPT-3 will do it for you. But we are still pretty far from this GPT-3 ideal in embodied agents. And second, massively multitask. A journalist agent, as its name implies, must be able to do more than a few tasks. It should be massively or even better infinitely multitask, as capable as what human language can express. And third, world knowledge. An agent should have common sense, understand how the world works through massively pre-trained knowledge, instead of just knowing a handful of concepts in the environment. Sorry, is there a question? Okay, so today's agents, uh, despite many shiny achievements are still not there yet. Um, deep reinforcement learning is able to beat human champions on Go and StarCraft and Dota, but these agents have a single objective to beat the opponent and can't really do anything else. And then the number of tasks are typically very limited, like a few dozen distinct tasks in robot learning. And finally, RO these days tend to have this tabula rasa mindset. For example, in Atari games, you don't need any world knowledge or common sense. And most of the time, the agent is trained from scratch. All it needs is reflex rather than knowledge and reasoning. So what do we need to get there? And I argue that there are three main ingredients in the recipe for generally capable agents. First, the environment needs to be open-ended enough because the agent's capability is upper bounded by the simulator. And if all that an environment supports is let's say block stacking, then we won't see any interesting emergent behavior even with a hundred billion parameters. And second, we need to provide the agent with massive pre-training data, just like what NLP folks are very used to doing. And to make it scalable, we should automatically scrape domain knowledge from the internet instead of manual curation to make the data rich, it should have diverse modalities like videos, images, text, etc. And finally, once we have the environment and database, we're ready to train our foundation models for the agents. It should have enough 
capacity to internalize all the data and induce emergent behaviors. And here the language will play the key role of both prompting, which is a way to specify the tasks and also grounding the concepts. And to satisfy all these three ingredients, we converge on Minecraft as our prime choice of environment. So for those who are not familiar, Minecraft is an open-ended, procedurally generated, um, complex 3D game. And it requires very sophisticated skills to excel in this game, like crafting, building, combat, and explore. Um, and this is uh, someone on YouTube building the entire uh, Hogwarts castle, block by block, in Minecraft. So Minecraft has 140 million active human players. And just to put that number in pers perspective, it is more than the population of the entire Mexico or twice the population of the UK. So this many human players, they collectively produced a big treasure trove of online knowledge. And then in Minecraft, as we uh, see here in the video, uh, people demonstrate many interesting emergent behavior and almost infinite level of creativity. So just to show some uh, beautiful videos, like this is someone building um, a house underground uh, and light it up with uh, these beautiful lamps. And then uh, actually Minecraft is Turing complete because there are blocks that can implement logic circuits inside the game. And this is someone building a working CPU exclusively in Minecraft. So we introduced MindDojo, a framework for developing generally capable agents in Minecraft. This is a montage of the infinite creativity that human players demonstrate. So this is how Minecraft, uh, MindDojo implements the three pillars I just mentioned. First, um, we provide open-ended environments. And second, uh, we have many different types of internet scale knowledge base. Here are the YouTube, Wiki, and Reddit, which I will go into more details later. And finally, given these two, uh, we are able to implement uh, at least a baby step towards this ideal of a journalist agent. So let's look at the open end environment first. Um, MindDojo has thousands of open ended tasks that we roughly divide into three categories programmatic tasks, creative tasks, and then playthrough. So for programmatic tasks, that means um, these tasks have easily verifiable success conditions. And for creative tasks, they're in contrast to programmatic tasks. They do not have well-defined or easily automated success criterion. Um, I will uh, give some examples later. And finally, we have a very special playthrough task that is more like a moonshot achievement. So for the programmatic tasks, um, they're um, defined by uh, having ground truth success conditions implemented in Python code. So you can easily write sparse or dense reward functions uh, directly uh, using, using code. And all of these tasks have a natural language prompt. So here are some examples. Uh, we divide into a few major categories for the programmatic tasks. Um, first is harvesting. So uh, an example is obtain one unit of emerald in rainforest. And a uh, harvesting task is very interesting because um, depending on the noun, let's say emerald or lava or pumpkin or a bookshelf, it would require agent very different skills. Like emerald, you will need to dig very deep into ground and lava, you may have to wear some special armor to protect yourself. And pumpkin, you have to like plant the seed and maybe grow the pumpkin yourself. And bookshelf requires a lot of crafting. But uh, for the prompt, it's, it's the same. You just change the noun but they will require very different skills. And then uh, tech tree. So in Minecraft, uh, there are many tools and uh, you need to unlock the previous uh, set of tools in order to progress in the tech tree. For example, here are the stone, iron, gold, and diamond technologies. And as you uh, master these technologies, you will unlock more and more resources that you can mine and uh, harvest. And then combat. So Minecraft is actually a pretty scary game. Uh, especially uh, during the night time inside the game, there are various monsters uh, that will just attack you and they have different properties. Uh, like here, we have like zombies, endermen and skeletons. Some are uh, melee while others are like long range fighters and you will need agile skills and planning and armor to beat these enemies. And all of these tasks can be programmatically checked. 
So the next set of tasks are creative tasks. And these tasks are uh, much harder to check. So for example, I want you to build a house, but then how do we um, decide what makes a house a house? So this is very much analogous to image generation where the only ground truth is human judgment. So humans will, will look at what you have built and tell you if you succeeded or not. Um, and, and here we include about uh, like more than a thousand these kinds of creative tasks. Um, so later we'll propose a model-based scoring method um, that is more like FID score, but it is embodied. So uh, the model will look at the behavior of the agent and then score whether the agent has succeeded in this task or not. And, and these are four examples of some of the creative tasks. And finally, there's a very special task um, called playthrough, and that is to beat the Ender, Ender Dragon. So Minecraft is an open-ended game. You don't really have a fixed objective, but there is a beat the game uh, mission in the traditional sense of the word. And that is to uh, find an Ender portal, go through it and beat this uh, kind of quote unquote final boss. So this task is extremely difficult. You need um, complex preparation, a lot of exploration, and of course, uh, agile combat skills, and you need a lot of resources to help you in this, uh, in this task. And typically for an average human player, it will take many hours, or uh, for a novice like me, it would probably take days uh, to beat the Ender Dragon. And that would roughly translate to about a million action steps in a single episode. So I think this is far beyond the capability of any state-of-the-art algorithms. And we're considering this as a moonshot achievement. So here in the video, we see that a human player has successfully beaten the Ender Dragon, but this is only the final stage. There's a very long preparation phase. So I do want to talk a little bit about how we're able to cu curate thousands of tasks. And we surely did not do all of this by hand. Um, so combined in my dojo, we have a benchmark of more than 3,000 tasks. Um, and for programmatic tasks, we're able to do template generation. As I mentioned, just change the noun, and you will get um, a large number of tasks that require diverse skills. Um, and for creative tasks, uh, we resort to YouTube videos because human players have already demonstrated many interesting things to do. And we can just piggyback on that and curate and filter some interesting tasks that human players have already come up with. And finally, uh, we can just ask GPT-3, chant some magic spells and GPT-3 will give us what we want. So here is our labeling interface. Um, so we first filter out uh, uh, automatically by some keywords, and then we put, this, um, we put some candidate videos into this labeling interface. And then uh, human curators will look at this, look at the description of the YouTube video, and decide whether this is a good task to be included. And, um, and then about GPT-3, uh, we use OpenAI's DaVinci API. And to our surprise, GPT-3 actually loves Minecraft. It knows an awful lot about it. And uh, we think that it's because uh, Minecraft is such a big game. So there's a lot of internet data that GPT-3 just accidentally trained on. So um, we just picked GPT-3's brain. Uh, we asked it, you know, brainstorm some tasks for us. And these are some examples uh, from GPT-3 uh, that are really interesting. And we included this in our creative tasks, like make a replica of the Eiffel Tower out of iron blocks or design and build a maze um, of different glass blocks. And then in addition to just creating the task, we find that GPT-3 can actually provide some step-by-step -step guidance um, for certain tasks. So let's say for the task, sail on a boat with a sheep, uh, we put this prompt like how to do this task in Minecraft, let's think step-by-step. Step. And then this is what GPT-3 gave us. So it is a, a pretty sensible plan. And we also included this information whenever available. So that concludes um, the uh, discussion on the open-ended environment. I'll pause for a few minutes uh, for, for questions, if uh, there is any. Or um, uh, uh, you can also type it in the chat and we can address the questions at the end. So feel free. Yeah, it is a seminar. I want to make this interactive. 
uh, how often are the instructions that GPG, GPT-3 generates actually correct if you try to execute them? Yes, so uh, first of all, these instructions are in natural language. So we'll need like uh, uh, models that are able to be conditioned on arbitrary language to really use this data. And our models are not quite there yet. So that is the first bit. And then second, uh, yes, GD3 can make some mistakes. Um, and we, we still decided to include um, all of the response from GD3 because even though it may have made some mistake, let's say at step three, um, like step one to four could still be very useful, but it's gonna be noisy. And if one thing that foundation models are good at is that they can handle these noisy data and still extract some signals from that. So we think it's uh, gonna be generally useful. But in the current paper, we did not really make use of the step-by-step -step guidance. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, could you please more elaborate how to handle the noise? So for example, in the YouTube video, mm -hmm. the, some video might be uh, might include lots of noise frames. And in in the in the wiki already, there are some posts include lots of so unnecessary sentence. Mm -hmm. Although in the paper, there's I think you you and your colleagues re utilize some tools to redu re reduce the noise, but I think it is impossible to remove all the noise. And sometimes, as you said, the noise can be more helpful to improve the performance for the generalization. So could you elaborate mm -hmm. this aspect, please? That is a great question. Um, indeed. So once we get to the internet skill, uh, I'll put it on this side. So once we get to the internet skill knowledge base, like um, this noise problem is inevitable. Um, let's say in, in YouTube data set, we can see like YouTubers streaming and then having ads uh, like kind of interleaved with their YouTube. Um, so it is very difficult to filter this out. And in the white paper, uh, we, had, uh, we did uh, uh, model-based filtering, uh, but that is only for like toxic or harmful contents. So we run like a toxic, like a detoxify tool that just checks the transcript. If there are anything offensive, we'll just remove that video. But we cannot really, um, filter out like the ads and all of those noise. And in our experiment, uh, later I will show the uh, kind of the starter agent that we implemented. Uh, so for that model, we did not do anything special to filter out the noise, uh, but still the model is able to perform quite well. Um, but I agree, like um, moving forward into the future, we may need to have so, some more model-based filters uh, that, you know, it, it can be like self-supervised or, you know, pseudo-labeled. Um, but we need to find some ways to implement these filters that uh, can get rid of the ads uh, and like uh, things that are not relevant to Minecraft. But for now, uh, we did not do too many filtering. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Uh, so since uh, the questions have already touched on the internet skill knowledge base and also the model, uh, I'll move on and then explain these. And yeah, we can come, up, uh, come back to questions in a moment. Cool, and the next section is about the YouTube wiki and Reddit data sets. So for the YouTube data set, we have uh, 700K YouTube videos adding up to about 300K hours of gameplay and about 2 billion words in the English transcript. For the wiki data set, we have 7,000 wiki pages um, that contain like text images, uh, tables and diagrams. And um, so human um, fans, they have curated uh, essentially every part of the game. They explained all the entities, NPCs, um, and game mechanisms that you ever need to know in Minecraft. So this is a very kind of concise and also clear information that uh, agents can potentially use. And then we also scraped 300K Reddit posts um, that have a lot of comments in the Minecraft subreddit. So uh, here's a, a cool montage of the YouTube data set. Um, of like seven uh, uh, of the 300K hours of gameplay. And we see that, yes, there will be some noise, but like in, in general, uh, this data um, is, is quite clean in general, because um, if people say that they are doing Minecraft, typically like most of the time, they will at least play, play the game in the video, uh, even though there could be some ads. And then, uh, yeah, this is um, a video um, showcase of the, uh, wiki data set. So we can see that on the wiki, these are all the NPCs and monsters that you will ever encounter in all versions of Minecraft. 
And then all the recipes, all the crafting recipes are in the wiki. And also there are like uh, huge chunks of explanations of like each um, objects and potions and what you will encounter in different terrains. And then we, we have the Reddit data set that has uh, 300K posts and also a lot of images. So what people typically do uh, on this subreddit is that they either do a showcase where they say, okay, I built this very cool uh, structure. And, and then people will say, oh, that is so cool. That is amazing. And then uh, the other case is people use it as a stack overflow for Minecraft, where here is an example. This is my first time in casing an ocean monument. Help, what is the best way to sponge it? And then the comments are actually really good advice. Like, you know, sponge only has this much power um, or, you know, you, you need like uh, the, the, the grid um, to, to make it work. And here are some more examples. Cool, so uh, this is a quick overview of our data sets. And now that we have these two, it's time to show uh, whether they actually work to train a generalist agent. So um, here, um, I want to say that in the white paper, um, we implement a very simple idea. And this is uh, meant to be a starter agent, kind of like a baby step towards the final ideal. And uh, we're very far from actually solving Minecraft. Uh, we're actively working on this and this is a call to action. We hope that the research community can um, uh, all collaborate and tackle this grand challenge together. So the very simple idea in, in the white paper is that MindDojo provides massive number of time aligned videos and transcripts from YouTube. So we can actually learn a reward model based on clip that associates the video and the open vocabulary text prompt. And given this reward model, we can just use any off-the-shelf RL method to optimize for the learned reward. So here, uh, let me first uh, explain like uh, what, what uh, the data looks like. So here are like three different video clips, all from uh, in the wild YouTube videos. And these are uh, the narrated uh, transcripts that pair with the video. So as we scrape from YouTube, uh, we have all the timestamps, so we know that this uh, particular chunk of text aligns with this uh, 10 seconds of video. So here, for example, the, the first one is about chopping wood, and the second is about uh, gathering stone, and third about how to uh, get some pork so you can make food in, in Minecraft. So once we have these paired data, we're able to train um, a, a model uh, based on clip that we are calling it MindClip. So for those who are unfamiliar with uh, clip, it is essentially a contrastive model, a contrastive learning method that associates image and text, but here we generalize it to associate video and language. So uh, for the video snippets and then the transcripts, we pass them to a video encoder and a text encoder, and we'll get some embeddings. And then uh, we do a contrastive learning um, loss, and this loss will be back propagated to update the video encoder and the text encoder. And once we have this model, we can um, put it in a, a live interaction loop as the agent explores in the simulator. So here we have the Mind Dojo simulator and the agent. The observation space has uh, RGB, of course, and we also provide some other information like GPS, voxels, and inventory, essentially all the information that human players also have access to. And then the agent uh, will take actions in the simulator. So let's say our task is to share sheep to obtain wool. So this is an example of a harvesting task. And as the agent explores, it will generate video snippets. So here we stack um, a number of history RGB frames to make a video. And then we pass this to MindClip model and MindClip will compute a contrastive score. So here, let's say it's uh, 0.95. Uh, if it gets closer to one, that means and the text and the video are associated well. And if it's closer to zero, that means they're um, un unrelated. So this will provide a reward signal to the agent because the agent needs to maximize um, that its behavior is best associated with the text prompt. And yeah, this is uh, all that the model has, a very simple idea, but it makes use of our uh, YouTube data set. Um, so I, I want to note that 
um, in the white paper, we did not really use the wiki and the Reddit data sets, um, but uh, those are also very, very rich data sources that we plan to do in follow-up works. And since all of these data sets are open access, we encourage the community to also make use of that. So here are some experiment results. In this, in this table, all of the numbers are success rates. And here we, we investigate eight different tasks. So in the green box here, these are our methods. Um, the attention and the average are like two different ways to aggregate, to aggregate uh, the video feature from the image features. So for, for the attention, um, we first compute image features independently for each image frame. And then we just run a transformer to summarize the sequence of image features into a video descriptor. And for the average, it is just average polling. And here, uh, these three are um, the, the baselines that I'll explain one by one. So first about the sparse only, because uh, all of these tasks, we have um, a ground truth uh, success condition. Uh, these are the programmatic tasks. So we just provide a, a sparse only reward to the agent where it is one if you complete a task at the end and zero otherwise. Um, so we can see that uh, the agent struggles um, in, in, in most of these tasks. And that is because um, let's say if you want to uh, hunt a cow, uh, once you approach the cow and you swing the sword, the cow will run away from you. And it is very difficult to kind of consistently explore um, to uh, try to catch up with a cow unless you have a dense reward. So for sparse, it's mostly failing. And then we implemented some manual reward functions. And, and these reward functions, sometimes they're based on privilege information like uh, LiDAR signals um, that uh, the agent does not have. So for the agent, it only has like RGB and, and like direct voxel, um, like surrounding voxels around it, and then some inventory information, but uh, it cannot like directly recognize um, that uh, the entity uh, in front of it is a cow. It needs to use vision to understand that. But uh, in the manual reward function, we query the ground truth location of the sheep and the cow and give it a shaping reward. So uh, we can see like this is uh, the performance are, uh, are, are much better using the manual reward. And you can consider that as kind of um, close to an upper bound of the performance. And then uh, these are uh, our, our results using uh, the mind clip dance reward because uh, for mind clip it can also give like a step-by-step -step dance reward signal to guide the agent um, so to our surprise actually for a few tasks it's able to even outperform the the manual reward so uh, we, we think that um, it might be because like in the manual reward sometimes it's not like smooth enough because if, if the lidar signal um, is not like uh, seeing a sheep in front of it then it might just lose track of it um, but for the uh, for for clip, it's able to provide uh, even an even smoother reward signal than the manual dance. Um, and we see that typically uh, the attention based uh, model outperforms the average pulling. Um, but sometimes, uh, like average pulling is a little bit better, um, and this could just be like stochastic noise um, because we train these uh, clip models uh, from like different initialization, and there might be some. Uh, uh, like some random variations in it. And finally, we have um, a baseline that simply uses uh, OpenAI's uh, image text clip model without training on our internet skill knowledge. Uh, and we just put that into, uh, into the, 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 the video model. Um, so we find that uh, the success rate is actually even worse than sparse only. And our hypothesis is um, like for uh, the clip model, because it's trained on natural image, but there is a big domain shift between natural image um, and uh, the Minecraft domain. So sometimes it's giving the agent misleading signals that is just better, that is actually worse than not giving it signals at all. So that's why like the clip model um, without any training uh, or internet skill data is completely failing. Yeah, and here are some uh, kind of demonstrations of the learn agent. Yes, um, and uh, so that concludes the experiment section um, of um, our work. And I want to uh, briefly also discuss some concurrent work uh, to my dojo. Um, and that is the VPT model, the video pre-training method from OpenAI. 
So uh, their model um, is very much complementary to ours. And it is interesting to see like the kind of uh, different uh, research communities kind of converge on Minecraft being a very good test bed for generally capable agents. So how VPT works is uh, first, um, they collected a large data set of human contractor data. Uh, and that data has uh, like clean video and also clean action sequences. And using that data, you can actually train a, a good inverse dynamics model. And once you have that model, you can use it to pseudo label um, a lot of unlabeled uh, YouTube videos in the wild. So also like OpenAI use uh, YouTube videos um, from, uh, from the internet. And once you have the pseudo labeled actions, you can treat uh, this bigger data set uh, of both the human contractor data and also the in the wild YouTube video as a big imitation data set. Um, and then you simply train an uh, uh, imitation agent from it using behavior cloning. Um, and yeah, uh, they, they got a very, very good uh, experiment results uh, on some long horizon tasks. And um, they also did, so after the behavior cloning, they also did fine tuning using handcrafted RO rewards and show like an even bigger improvement. So um, a, a few differences uh, between MindDojo and VPT. Um, first, our technique um, is conditioned on language and it is open vocabulary. The reward function is uh, trained using uh, transcripts in the wild, but VBT is not conditioned on language. It is only using the video pixels. Uh, and then second, um, I think VPT is uh, really good at these long horizon tasks because um, they're not trained from scratch using RL. They're using behavior cloning on long horizon. So they can actually carry out uh, an action for like uh, more than a thousand steps. Um, and for, for, for my clip, because we're training uh, from PPO uh, using PPO from scratch. So uh, this task cannot be like super long horizon. Otherwise there will be like exploration issues and sample inefficiency. Um, but uh, we think that uh, these two works are very much complementary, and um, a promising direction is to use um, OpenAI's behavior clone model and then fine tune with uh, the MindClip reward, which is open vocabulary and that may um, enable like training agents that can do uh, much more open ended tasks. Um, there's a question yeah. in the chat. So, yes. how many frames mm -hmm. are used as context for the video encoder? Um, so, we're using, using 16 frames. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it, it is not like super long horizon. Um, and also our mind clip model uh, is about um, uh, on, on the order of 100 million parameter scale. And in the future, we want to scale that up, um, uh, both in the number of parameters and also in the context length. So mind clip in the future will be able to um, kind of take into account uh, like a longer uh, history to really tackle those multi-step tasks. Yeah, thanks for the question. What is the frame, frame rate that you use? Um, you, you mean you mean for the video? Yes. Yeah, so, like, if you say sixteen frames of uh, input, what? How long? Like, what the length of the video are you considering in sixteen frames? Yeah. So the frame rate, uh, the frame rate is uh, decided by the simulator, and, and actually that is a very good question because um, on YouTube, um, actually, like the kind of the frame rate could be different for different videos. So even though like the physical frame rate is the same, but you know, like some YouTubers may speed up their video, others may like slow down it a little bit. So the actual like semantic frame rate uh, could be different and could vary. Um, so the way we do it is uh, when we're sampling those video snippets from YouTube, we also do like uh, some temporal augmentation. So like we, we sample with like different frame rates. So like uh, for some uh, video snippets, they actually like longer horizon semantically, while others could be shorter horizon. Um, and we, we just do that as a data augmentation. So it would like the trained model will be uh, kind of, it will better generalize to whatever frame rate that a simulator has. Yeah, that's a great question. All right, but, but on average, what, what is the length of the video segment that you're considering? Because for example, on, on, yeah. on Atari, six, 16 frames would be like less than a second, right? So. That's why I'm curious how long the context actually looks like. So it's about eight seconds when we're training in YouTube. Okay, got it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. 
And I have another question about the experiment mm -hmm. table, if you yeah. can go back to it. Uh, when you show the results here for the eight tasks, do you actually have one model, like one set of weights that play the eight tasks, or are you fine tuning eight individual model for each of the eight tasks? Great question. So here we group it into uh, two groups. So we trained one model that can do four tasks each. Um, and, and this is more just bottleneck by the hardware because we're training it on a single node and uh, Minecraft is uh, a bit heavy on CPU and we're doing parallelization. So we can't really easily parallelize, uh, let's say like, like uh, 20 different tasks. So we, we chose to do like four tasks for each group. But yeah, there is no like algorithmic uh, constraint on the number of tasks that you can train together. Great question. But right, but like, is there like some yeah. kind of uh, interference or like um, gen like uh, mm -hmm. improved generalization from the fact that you're doing several tasks at once? So for example, if you take the mm -hmm. manual reward, like the, yeah, the human engineer reward and you train four individual models for the, let's say the, harvesting tasks, mm -hmm. the first group, do you actually see like better performance for each of these four tasks or do you see decreased performance? How does it look like? Yeah, so we do not have that uh, that study in the paper, but uh, we did try it uh, when we were, we were uh, doing the implementation. Um, so like given similar amount of samples, like the results are, are similar, but, uh, but let's say like on a single node, if you uh, kind of use all the CPUs for single task, then um, you essentially, collect more data, um, like the data throughput is more. And if you train the same amount of time, then actually like for each in individual task, you're training at for, for more episodes. So that would result in higher performance, but like given kind of the same samples, they're like roughly as good. Okay, thank yeah. you. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thanks. thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, uh, I also want to discuss uh, a bit about some, uh, some other works uh, around Minecraft. So we're not the first to develop uh, AI on top of Minecraft. And, and actually like the, uh, the initial effort uh, dates back to, I think it was like 2016. Um, so Microsoft uh, who owns Mojang Studio, uh, who made Minecraft, um, they open source a framework called Malmo um, that uh, essentially gives a programmatic API um, for AI to control Minecraft. And uh, our work uh, is uh, built upon Malmo. So thanks a lot for the um, initial efforts from Microsoft. And then uh, there is a MindRO challenge that has been hosted at NeurIPS uh, for the past three years. And MindRO is uh, an abstraction layer on top of Malmo that uh, provides a, a nicer Python API and also like a, just in general, a better interface. And MindDojo um, is, uh, built upon my RO and we did a lot of modifications, uh, adding the task suite and also adding all the uh, internet scale data. Um, but also a, a big shout out to my RO uh, for all of the great work in making this API uh, very user friendly. And, and there are some more separate efforts, uh, some not uh, in the embodied agent learning, but more on the creativity side. So here the evil craft challenge is about um, how to create like how to let AI generate structures um, that are open-ended and interesting. So uh, for this AI, like it, it does not really have like action space or interacting uh, with the environment, but it's more like generating these artifacts um, in, in one go. Um, and it's more on the kind of the creative and open-ended uh, architecture side. But uh, I think this is also a very interesting initiative. Um, and here is uh, just a quick walkthrough of our, uh, of our website. So uh, it's mindojo.org and you can uh, see examples of our multitask suite and the internet scale knowledge base. You can click on each card and then uh, our code has been open sourced. So you can look at our quick start guide. We have a very extensive documentation page. Uh, so on this page, uh, you can sample uh, some videos from our YouTube knowledge base. Yeah, so here are some, some examples. You can play it on the website. Um, and typically the tutorial videos um, are higher quality than the general gameplay videos. So we partition the data set into two. And yeah, these are the general gameplay. They tend to be 
noisier, as you can see, like there are some ads in it. Um, yeah, and, and this is an overview of the wiki data set. And finally, the Reddit data set. So you can sample like different posts. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, sorry. please visit our website today. Mm -hmm. We have two more questions um, on chat. So first yes, one, please. any intuition on why inverse dynamics model is able to generalize from a relatively small number of videos and provide signal to a policy that is trained on a larger number of videos? Um, so you mean like how, how does the, yeah, I'll jump to this one. So you mean that how, how does this inverse dynamics model generalize to in the wild YouTube videos? Is that a question? Um, yes, yeah, so I guess since you train it on some number of videos and then the question is how do you generalize, how does that generalize to a larger number, number of videos? I see, yeah. So uh, this is from uh, OpenAI's work um, and uh, the inverse dynamics is trained on um, a, a large amount of uh, human contractor data. So that is like very clean. Um, and uh, yeah, like in, in their paper, they, they show some analysis of the uh, inverse dynamics model on different amounts of data. Um, and then for the in the wild um, YouTube videos, uh, yes, like they are much noisier, um, but uh, still like the domain gap between the actual game frames from the simulator and in the wild YouTube videos are not that big. Like the domain gap will be much bigger for sim to real in robotics, but not really for Minecraft. So I think that's is it because, uh, like the reason why it works. Yeah. Can I ask, is it because this 2K videos, they explicitly try to make it as like diverse as possible? Is, is that what's minimizing the domain gap? Like maybe maybe in the 70K hours of videos, they don't have like very different tasks or something, right? Uh, yes, I think so. So they have like uh, ocean or like forest, like different terrains. So at least you've seen like some of the basic textures of some like common terrains. Um, yeah, and I think like for the tasks they demonstrate in the paper, um, like uh, there are maybe four tasks demonstrating in the paper. So it's not like a thousand tasks. Um, so yeah, I, I think like neither VBT nor MindClip is like anywhere close to the ideal of like uh, a single agent conditional language that can solve like thousands of tasks. Um, so these are all like baby steps towards it. Thanks. And a second yeah, uh, question in the chat is for longer term tasks, would it be necessary to train on longer videos? For example, if the task mm -hmm. would be significantly longer than the length of an individual video, how could the reward function be well-defined? That is a great question. So uh, I think there are a few ways forward. So first is uh, brute force, like just, you know, scale up mind clip, make the uh, context lens as long as possible. So we can do like, you know, transformer Excel or perceiver, like any of those efficient uh, long horizon transformers, we, we can make use of that. Um, so that is, that is one way, uh, a pretty straightforward way to scale it up. And the second way is actually to leverage the GPT-3 step-by-step guidance. So let's say you have a task like build um, a haunted house, right? Like this task seems to be very complex. You need to get the resources and then, you know, build the house and build the uh, decorations and maybe invite a few like ghosts or monsters into the house. It is a super long horizon. Um, and it would be very difficult for any model to, to really just uh, do it in, in, in one shot. So maybe we should um, query GP3 to get us the best of guidance on how to build a haunted house and then use each step as um, like an input to my club. So essentially like breaking down this time horizon by uh, querying those large models to give a detailed plan. And we can do this hierarchically. So, um, you know, to uh, build a haunted house, there may be like four major steps, but for the first step, like collect resources, you will need um, 100 uh, blocks of wood, uh, 200 blocks of iron, for example, and we can ask the model to break it down even more. So we can hierarchically break it down uh, to like short horizon text prompt, and then we query mine club to provide like shaped reward for each stage. So, so that is another idea for work. Yeah, thanks. It's a great question, yeah. I have some follow-up questions regarding the video. So you said that you are mm -hmm. using 60, 60 frames by, for, the, for training the mind quest. That means that like, like, like usual video action recognition, do, do, do you just sample I uniformly sample 16 frames from, from each clip. That's mm -hmm. one question. And the second question is, 
um, if I remember correctly, you also use the, the caption in the YouTube, which is some automatically generated or some uh, some uh, author generated. So I think you match it with the clip and the 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 video the video itself, the frame itself. So but but that means that in like like the question. So if the if one one sentence cover lots of frames, then then how how then do you do you, do you think that just just using the the whole frame, like increasing the number of frames, such as some i three D with sixty four frame, or even further is better, or just use uniform sample is the same? Yes. Okay. So um, I, I think the the question is like how um, so like for first like how to kind of stack stack the frames, and second That's is right. can we use um, models like i three D or like longer horizon models? Um, yeah. So so the first for the first question. Uh, we stack like the last 16 frames and it is actually a moving window because as the agent is uh, interacting with the environment, um, it will accumulate more and more RGB frames. So we um, keep a queue and then we take like the last 16 frames as a moving window and uh, provide it to, to, to my clip. So it will give uh, essentially a dense reward at every step. So that's to answer your first question. And for the second question, uh, yes, I think like any kind of uh, video models that increase the horizon, either using transformers or using like i3D or, or like S3D or some other video models, um, that will definitely help. But one caveat is, um, uh, is that because we are running this mind clip model during RL, that means it, it's, it's very heavy. Like typically in Atari games, the reward computation is trivial. But here, the reward computation actually needs to do forward prop, so like a uh, hundred million parameters. So it is very heavy, and we did do some system optimization. Like, um, so for each frame, for each image frame, we just encode it separately, and we just cache these features because it is a moving window. We don't have to recompute the the last n image frames. Um, but this optimization only works if you encode each image independently and then have like a uh, video aggregator on top of the image features. But if you use i3D, that means at every time step, you need to go from the pixels, even though the moving window has a lot of overlap, you still need to like go from all the way from pixels. So that would be like uh, probably 10 times more latency for each step. So that is a caveat of using models like i3D or like optical flow or things like that. Yeah, and okay. does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Great question. Uh, any more questions in the chat? That's all for now. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, I'm uh, approaching the end of the talk and, and my dojo has been open sourced um, and we hope to build a vibrant research community around it. Uh, so yeah, please uh, everyone give us feedback, try this out today, try out the data, everything, uh, let us know what you think, and also let us know how um, we can better support your research. So this is our team. Um, this is my, my contact, uh, and uh, my website is jimfan.me. Uh, feel free to reach out to me or like any of the co-authors here. And, and yeah, thanks to our team uh, for making this happen. It is a huge effort. Uh, yeah, that wouldn't be possible without all the support. And thank you so much to all the audience for the Absolutely fantastic questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. I'm happy to take more talk. questions. Yeah. Thanks for the great talk. And yeah, if anyone else has questions, please unmute yourself or use the chat. I guess I can I can ask one. Um, mm -hmm. Can you go back to the to the policy training result table? where you compare uh, training yeah. out clip mm -hmm. versus training out manual reward. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was wondering, is the difference between uh, the clip reward and the manual reward mostly different in the quality of the reward is given or is it due to something else? If it's due to the quality of reward, are there some other training scheme that might be better than clip? Um, so you, you mean like the reward, um, yeah, do, do you mind? Uh, Seeing your question again, yeah, like, yeah. Are, are you asking yes, like yes, the yes. quality of the reward functions or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so uh. 
so there is a for harder tasks, there is a gap between the man, man clip reward versus the manual right. design reward. Right. And I was wondering if it's a fundamental limitation of the uh the clip training scheme or uh, mm -hmm. or is the reward is fine, it's just something else that's uh that's causing the difference. I see. Yeah. Um so that is a great question. And I think the failure modes can be can be many. Um, so one failure mode um, is that uh, like sheep actually runs faster than cow. So if the sheep kind of you know goes uh, quickly away from the player, then it becomes very small on the screen. And then uh, we find that like clip is not very good at like recognizing those like super small objects. And that could be some artifacts uh, that that uh, we had um, during the training. Um, so that's one thing. And then uh, second, um, like the clip model, we only train it in the white paper. We only train it on a subset of our big YouTube data set uh, because of some, some resource constraints. So we'd imagine that um, for the recognition problem, maybe as we scale to the full data set, uh, we might be able to overcome some of that. Um, and then uh, there might also be some problems with uh, like PPO because like exploration uh, could be noisy and, and all, of that, all of those problems. So we think that um, the um, kind of the, the next step is to adopt models like OpenSVPT, where it's trained by behavior, behavior cloning. So at least it has a very good foundation to work with. So it already knows how to walk in a straight line. It already knows how to um, like craft and navigate and then avoid obstacles. So we don't have to relearn all of those basic skills every time from scratch. And then a model can um, only, uh, the model only needs to focus on the high level task specified by the language. And that uh, may result in uh, stable training. And yeah, we're, we're still working on that. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for the question. Oh, sorry, uh, can I ask a follow-up question? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I guess, I guess for the mind clip training, there is not explicit notion of temporal smoothness, right? your corresponding segments mm -hmm. to video segments to text, but uh, there's not explicitly saying that this segment is after that segment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, do you think that's an important missing component or is it, uh, do, do you think it will be fine as long as you train just on larger data? I, I think it is an important component because currently uh, MindClip only takes into account like 16 frames. And because it is trained this way, um, I would uh, find it, uh, difficult, uh, it, like it will probably um, be very difficult to give a good dense shaping reward for super long, long horizon tasks. So let's say um, for the task build a house. Um, so MindClip uh, in our experiments, MindClip can recognize the house. Like once the house is, is built, it can give you a pretty good score, but building a house requires collecting resources, like chopping down tree first, and then, you know, uh, build a wall and build a door and build a roof. And we don't think MindClip is able to give like a dense shaping reward on these kind of steps. So yeah, that could be a problem and a limitation of the current formulation of MindClip. But then um, as I briefly mentioned previously, like we can uh, ask GPT-3 to break, break down uh, the, the long horizon task into like smaller snippets. And of course we want to scale up MindClip by um, making its context lens longer. So all of these are ways to remedy it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, everyone, please try it out. Uh, let us know what you think. Um, yeah. Okay, any more questions? I guess if not, then thank you so much. It was great having you. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for like organizing and a great audience here.